Let's try to uh, let's try to get started. So we make sure we get through everything. We have people in the adjoining rooms. <clears throat> so if you need to go over there, please do. Or you're more than welcome to find a find a spot on the uh, on the stairs if it's comfortable. I received a tidal wave of emails uh, in the last 24 hours. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, anything that came in after like 2 a.m. probably I haven't read it yet, but I will. And if it didn't, uh, if we don't cover what's in your email, if we don't cover it here, then I'll I'll respond to you. Um, so this is uh, this is essentially a review of the whole section now. <clears throat> um, and I've exclusively chosen slides that cover material I got emails about. Um, I had to choose some way to limit it, and that was the choice. So um, for the most part, I've covered everything I heard from you about. There will be exceptions, and ask us in office hours or um, send another email if I, if I neglect it. Uh, this is it, finally. Uh, it's, you can move on now to evolution, but um, you also have two lectures in evolution before your exam. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to come on Wednesday and come on Friday and um, shift your thinking to evolution in the lecture. Um, please come to these lectures. The, the, I've said it before, I think, that uh, it's been demonstrated that those who come to lectures do on average a, a full grade better in this course. Um, there, you know, whether we continue the webcasts in this course partly depends on attendance. Attendance goes down so much with the webcasts, they might just have to get dropped. Um, we never wanted to do that because it penalizes the students who come to lectures and use the webcasts. But uh, if you like the webcasts, one way to make sure they continue is to come to lectures. Uh, okay. Uh, I wish I had a good excuse for my black eye, um, that I was fighting bad guys or something. Um, not, not so much. Uh, a bad hop playing softball yesterday at shortstop. Uh, yeah. Um, it could have been worse. All right. So uh, let's start by reviewing. Um, I'm going to go through the lecture sequentially and address questions I received in the context of when the material was presented. Um, the first lecture was mostly storytelling about the history of ecology, um, an introduction to the phenomenon of natural history, the, the pursuit of natural history, and how ecology as a science derived from natural history, and how ecology as a science is based in good natural history today, and discussion of, um, from Chauvet Cave through Linnaeus and Darwin, and uh, with looks at some exemplary naturalists. The second lecture, um, in, in this I'm, I'm trying to suggest a nice link, although it's still somewhat unfounded in the history of science, uh, between ethology, the science of animal behavior, and ecology. Because ecology, um, at least the ecology of animals, is fundamentally related to the activity of individual organisms. And the activity of individual organisms, animals at least, um, concerns their behavior, their physiology, and their individual interactions with the environment. And this is a, um, this is a bridge that needs to be better formed between the science of individuals and the study of uh, ecosystems. We do that somewhat better in the study of plants. And for that, I gave you a, an example from ecophysiology, which I'll address in a little while. But we, we talked about some of the um, founders of ethology, um, some discussion of group behavior in organisms, and uh, modes of learning in animals in relation to their environments and their foraging strategies. I didn't have too many questions on, uh, on those topics. 
the levels of organization concept, this, general, this orienting generalization that we use in biology and in science. Um, one, one aspect of this that I wanted to highlight that's important partly as a result of the evolution of language and the evolution of terminology is the fact that the ecosystem is considered a distinct level above the community and below the biosphere. And the landscape is sometimes uh, used in addition to this or as a substitute for this. But the term ecosystem gets much wider usage now. We use the prefix eco for just about everything these days, which is just fine. It's a sign of the times that we have a greater awareness of ecology in popular, um, popular culture. But the term ecosystem is also used very frequently as a shorthand for ecological system. And any living system is in interaction with its physical environment. There are two sides of one biological coin, the living phenomenon and the abiotic phenomenon. And that's just a, that's a very adequate shorthand for any system at any level of biological organization, the ecosystem or the ecological system. In this way, you can see that an, an individual organism, such as yourself or your dog or cat, is a kind of ecosystem. It has a bunch of other organisms living in it and on it, and it's in constant communication with the physical environment through exchange processes. So I'm perfectly okay with people referring to a cellular ecosystem even. An atomic ecosystem? I'm not sure about that. I think that uh, stretches our definitions because part of our definition of an, of an ecosystem is the living component, right? So you can look at these as levels of organization in the, in the ecological hierarchy and then think about each of these things as an ecosystem um, in the narrow sense as well. Then we started to move into population ecology. We, we tried to follow the hierarchy of uh, levels uh, from the individual now to the population. Um, we discussed sampling techniques um, with direct counts and relative measurements of individual numbers and density. I think I have a slide pertaining to that. In case I don't, uh, a couple people asked the difference between numbers of individuals in a population and density. It's just um, density concerns the area, the space, the spatial context for the number of individuals, whether it's the area of land or the volume of water. Uh, the density is the total number of individuals per unit space. Uh, number of individuals is just how many there are without reference to that. We talked about metapopulation, ecology, gave a quick example. Dispersion patterns. This is an, as an example of a uniform dispersion in desert plants as a result possibly of resource competition or allelopathy. And we talked about um, an example of squirrels from the Sierras in, in how we construct life tables and survivorship tables. And then um, we define these terms iteroparis and semiparis, which a lot of people had problems with. So I'll, I'll cover those. Yeah, this was my slide to cover density. You just go count the trees out in the eucalyptus grove and you get the total number of trees. But if you measure how, measure the plot of land on which they grow and give your estimate of the number of trees relative to that plot of land, you'll have your density. Iteroparis just means reproduction repeated during the lifetime of an individual. And it, you can see the root of the word iterare um, to repeat in there. So an organism that repeats, more than, repeats reproduction more than once, and a couple people ask, are humans iteroparis? Are they? Yeah. Um, as a species, yes. I mean, uh, we are capable of reproducing more than once in our lifetimes. Semiparis, semel from once, um, reproduces once. Uh, people ask, does the organism have to die right after it reproduces? Um, 
Not necessarily, but most organisms don't <laughs> continue to live after they've completed reproduction. What's the point in a Darwinian context, right? Um, humans are, and I alluded to that, humans are somewhat unique in our, in our uh, long life after menopause, for example, um, and the roles that grandparents play in human cultures. Um, you can think about that on your own time if you want. Lots of people had questions about population models and um, the equations behind them. And I, I can't review everything here, of course. You've done a lot in your labs already. Um, see me in office hours, go to the GSI's office hours for, for details on this. It's, you know, we, we'd spend a lot of time on it in the labs also. Um, I'll do a little bit here on particular points, but uh, we'll have to save it for outside. Yes? Yes. It, the definitions of those terms don't concern that. Um, usually an organism that, re that reproduces, so uh, without rephrasing the question, I'll just try to uh, clarify. Um, usually an organism that reproduces once produces a lot of offspring. Uh, it's a big bang uh, episode of reproduction. That's as a general rule. You have one chance and you might as uh, well produce a lot of offspring. Um, does that help? Okay. Yeah, but the definitions don't really concern um, the, the numbers of offspring produced technically. It's as a general rule, though, the semilparous organisms uh, produce a lot. Okay, so we, um, we used our little sparrows as a general model for, um, for estimating population numbers as a function of births and immigrations and deaths and births. Did I say that right? No. Immigrations and emigrations, and um, births and deaths. This is a death, um, as dictating um, population numbers. Um, you can see this very phenomenon. I saw a, an attack, at least, uh, this weekend up in the park. Um, you can see this in the hills. We have great bird-eating birds here in the Bay Area. And uh, they're hard to watch because they move so fast, for one thing. Um, but you can see them. Um, yes, and we started with a discussion of exponential growth and gave a few examples of real-world exponential growth, and humans represent a great example of that, but we looked at elephants and elephant seals, um, and then limits to growth, limits to population growth, particularly with reference to, to competition, but other factors limit population growth relative to the density of the population. For example, predation could. If predators turn their focus to a growing population, they can serve as a check on that growing population. Then we built in the concept of carrying capacity of an, of an environment, the carrying capacity of an environment. I have a couple slides to talk about that. Um, and um, added a term in our population growth equation to accommodate carrying capacity. And I tried to stress the complexity of um, population growth dynamics. We, we tend to use nice smooth curves in our examples and um, use examples from the lab or nature that fit these nicely. But most populations grow um, with complex dynamics, chaotically sometimes, which is not to say without order. Um, chaotic population growth may be highly ordered, but extremely hard to predict. This is a a step we just glossed over, and for good reason, because you don't need to understand calculus to use these equations in here. We glossed over this step from our equation for fixed growth in fixed intervals. So growth in inter intervals of time, for example, one year of time, or one reproductive cycle of time, to instantaneous growth represented by the, this differential equation. 
We glossed over that transition because it's the, it requires calculus. You don't need to understand that step, but what you need to recognize is that this equation differs from this equation as the one concerns fixed intervals of time and the other, the latter, inst time instantaneously, measured moment by moment. And that's a lot more useful for uh, most purposes in ecology, to think of population growth instantaneously and not to have to wait across seasons um, to uh, really apply our models. Um, so dn dt, as we, as we say it, equals the per capita rate of growth times the number of individuals in the population. dn dt equals r times n, right? Now r is um, a difficult topic, and um, your textbook handles it okay, it's, but you look at other textbooks and um, they all, many of them handle it differently. So try to keep it simple in your understanding of R. We, we defined it as R equals little b minus little d. R equals the per capita birth rate minus the per capita death rate. But you sometimes see R as um, defined as the intrinsic rate of increase of a population or the intrinsic rate of growth of a population, suggesting somehow that it's an intrinsic, um, it's an intrinsic part of the biology of an organism. And that's how we use it in many of these models. We assume that R doesn't change over time. We assume that R is fixed and other aspects of the ecology of the organism change. So we assume it's intrinsic to the species in question, the population in question. And that's fine, um, but if we, if we go back to our, the way we defined R mathematically as births minus deaths, per capita births minus per capita deaths, we can see that those are dynamic <coughs> properties of the organism. And if they change, then R is going to change. So keep that complexity in mind, but um, try to keep it simple because uh, I won't do anything fancy on the exams in relation to this. And it just, just reminds me, uh, you know, you'll never be asked to define something. Uh, these are multiple choice exams. And if my definitions differ from the book, I don't think they're contradicting anything in the book. At least I haven't heard of any. Um, but they may emphasize different things, and that's fine. It's the only problem, only problem arises if there's a contradiction. So you can see the effect of R on growth, of course. I think you're probably understanding this now. A higher R is going to lead, a, lead to a steeper, um, steeper J in this exponential growth context. But growth does not continue unchecked. It's, that's, uh, that's an impossibility on Earth because of um, a limitation of resources, usually. And there are, and population growth is regulated. This is where the terms density dependent and density independent come in. A lot of confusion around those terms as well. Recognize that density dependence and density independence is in relation to population growth and regulation. So this is a, the classic type of curve for density dependent growth regula regulation. In this context, it's competition with an increase in the number of plants per unit per, um, in the neighborhood of an individual Sorry. An increase in the number of plants in a unit area leads to a decrease in the number of seeds of the individuals in that area. Fecundity is affected by density. And you see the typical negative relationship between the two. That's density dependent regulation because as density increases, reproduction is affected. It's dependent, reproduction is dependent on density. And the population is, is regulated as a result by density, density factors. And that's an example from um, competition. But these are, these are also types of density dependent forces that could regulate population growth including the fouling of the environment by the inevitable production of waste by organisms as they grow, 
or other factors. Density independent factors, and again, I don't have a slide for it, would, it, would limit growth, would regulate growth without reference to how many individuals are present in the area. That's the sense in which it's density independent. The effect of these factors and natural disasters are usually cited as primary ones, physical abiotic <coughs> forces that affect population growth. They often affect, they sometimes affect populations without reference to their density. They're density independent in their effects in that sense, okay? When you really delve into them, they often have some relationship to density. An example would be a cataclysmic windstorm. If it were to strike now and hit the eucalyptus grove, the trees will either fall down or they won't fall down, right? Depend, doesn't really matter how many trees are in the grove. Well, wait, it kind of does because of edge effects. The trees on the edges will be much more likely to be affected than trees in the interior. So depending on how many trees are there, you're going to have greater buffering of the central area. One example of something you might at first blush think of as a density independent force, a windstorm. But in fact, when you get into it, density plays a role. So if you want um, cataclysmic uh, meteor strike here on Berkeley, um, that should take care of the eucalyptus grove, no matter whether there are 10 or 100 trees in it. That's a m simpler example. Alley effects, yay. Everyone's confused by these. <laughs> and, um, and I'm partly to blame for that. Well, maybe wholly to blame for that. Um, but it's because I'm trying to add to something that's in the book. Much of my understanding is based on a couple of recent reviews of the subject, including this one in trend, Trends in Ecology and Evolution. The book highlights an important aspect of the alley effect, where populations that dip below a certain um, number of individuals can be prone to extinction. Populations that go below a certain size, instead of rapidly expanding in their growth, which your, um, your exponential model would predict, and even your logistic model would predict, instead, some of these populations instead head the other way and head toward extinction. That is an alley effect, and it's the one your book highlights. And an example might be a, um, an organism that defends itself in groups say a, a, a f group of fish that schools and defends itself in schools. <coughs> Schooling, as we've talked about, has, a, has a, an effect on predators that makes, it, makes the, the schooling individuals harder to capture. But when, this, when that school gets smaller and smaller, the, it might get to a point where the individuals are extremely easy just to individuate and pick off by the predators. So below a certain size, the population trends to extinction rather than what your models would predict, which is um, rapid expansion because of an abundance of resources and a lack of competition and so forth. So that's the zone of the negative effect, where your population size drops below a certain level, this level, and your per capita growth rate is less than zero in that region. It's negative, and a negative per capita growth rate is going to lead to local extinction. But there's also this zone of positive effect, and this is what your book doesn't highlight. So if we think of this as one species of organism following this curve, it can experience a negative type LE effect when its population is below a certain size, but above this size, it's experiencing a positive effect where with increases in density, its per capita growth rate is going up. Its R is growing up, going up. That's the zone of positive effect. And if you want, you can think of the same example. A fish school that's this big does pretty well against predation, but a fish school that's this big does really well. And the individuals are able to uh, spend more time foraging and more time dedicating resources to reproduction, and they'll increase um, quite rapidly. At some point, that school bumps into reality, and the trend is to follow your typical um, logistic patterns. 
and to resemble at those higher levels of density the standard relationship of negative density dependence, dependence which that uh, very faint line represents. So just think about the two types of alley effect and add the positive type <laughs> to what's given in your book. And recognize that this is a case of uh, um, the term became simplified over some years, but now when people are taking a closer look at it, they realize it's a more complex problem. And um, your book doesn't reflect that. <coughs> Logistic growth. I'm not going to spend much time here, folks. Um, please talk to me in office hours if, if this continues to be a, a struggle. And I know it does for some people. Um, the, fa um, the sigmoid growth model, um, where we've taken carrying capacity and built it in to our equation. Um, yeah, I, I would need a lot more time to, to work on that. So go back to the webcast, see, see us in office hours, and if there's anything else, um, beg for help. Come to my house and knock on the door. <laughs> Interspecific relationships. Here's one. Um, I don't think I defined the term symbiosis for you, uh, but a couple people have asked about it. Maybe I've mentioned it. Um, for one reason, because there aren't any clear definitions, any um, fixed definitions of it. I like to use the more general definition, a symbiosis. The, ter the terms just mean sim together, biosis, uh, living, living together. Um, it usually implies a very close, or as the, the textbooks often say, intimate type of living together, um, which means the dynamics of the interacting populations are um, closely connected. There are times when people just mean mutualism by symbiosis, the, a type of cooperation or positive effects on the participating organism. We certainly don't want to do that. <coughs> But do we want to include something like predation or herbivory in the context of symbiosis? Um, I'm okay with doing that. It's, you know, it's just, uh, just a word, and it's a word that um, many people use differently, symbiosis. I don't even tend to use it that technically for that reason, because it's so, it's so loose, lo loosely used. So I don't really care. You know, one of your practice exam questions, um, the answer given was, included predation as a type of symbiosis. Um, I won't, I, you know, I wouldn't put that on your exam. I won't put anything about symbiosis on your exam, I promise. Um, it's a loose term, and you can choose how to use it, uh, narrowness or breadth that you like. Those other terms are more specific. Um, we started talking about the competitive exclusion principle in Gauss in the discussion of interspecific relationships, and um, I'll talk about the niche concept a little bit. People are still struggling with that. And we highlighted um, this categorization scheme of interspecific relationships concerning the effects on the participants, whether negative, positive, or neutral. And then looked at some examples of um, aposematism, or aposematism, and mimicry, and then um, dynamics, our population growth dynamics when more than one species is involved in, for example, predator-prey cycles. Um, I just, you don't need to memorize these equations. I just want you to recognize this is one way to model interspecific interactions by building in a simple coefficient to the equation that represents, in this case, competition. And the effect of one organism, a second species, on another species. The more I say, the more I'll bring confusion to this. So <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that for now. The challenge here is to build this term in that um, <coughs> puts it in terms of the number of individuals of the first species. So you're subtracting these individuals from your first <coughs> species. Yeah, I've probably confused some of you already. I'll, I'll just be quiet on that one. You will not hear much about this on the exam. I just want you to understand that um, multiple species can be modeled um, using our, our standard equations. What's the ghost of competition path? What does it refer to? <laughs> <laughs>
Can anyone state that succinctly? Realized niches. In a sense, yes. Um, this example um, shows these lizards in their realized niches where they, they forage in different parts of the habitat. Someone else back here? Did someone else want to have a try? Saw a hand. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's, it's an explanation for this um, distribution of species in the environment, these realized niches, with reference to competition in the past having resulted in this configuration. So somehow, and so it's a way to explain the lack of competition, but observed structure in a community with reference to <laughs> competition having occurred in evolutionary time in the past. In a way, it's explaining away the problem, and that's one of the difficulties ecologists have with the idea, um, this reference to a past ghost. Um, but quite, quite logical also to um, think that competition could have structured these populations previously, and what we see now is the uh, result of that. The niche, I've got to talk about the niche. Um, the niche. The niche is not just a habitat of an organism. The, one of the traditional definitions of a niche is an organism's profession or its place in the community. Um, and that's drawing a metaphor from human society, of course. Um, the profession of, of this species of lizard is to occupy the fences and forage for insects there, as if it's performing a role in the community that others don't perform. <coughs> it's a shame I didn't spend more time on this because the, in the history of ecology, G. Evelyn Hutchinson expanded on that original concept of the niche with his idea of an n-dimensional hypervolume. And I wanted to talk about that today, but I decided why add a complex term at this point, an n-dimensional hypervolume. But it really does belong in the ecology course, so um, maybe you can look it up yourselves <laughs> on your own time. It was a way to bring a traditional natural history approach to the niche into a more mathematical concept, and it had a great influence on the way we study and model communities, this idea of an n-dimensional hypervolume. But the traditional approach is still okay. One of the earliest definitions of a niche was by the founder of our museum here as um, it's just the natural history of the species in nature, what that, what that organism does in nature, not just where it lives, but the things that, that, eat, that it eats, its ranges of tolerance to physical factors, the total, uh, total package, it's its niche. I'm going to have to go a little faster here. Mullerian and Batesian mimicry. Oh my. Um, lots of confusion on that because I glossed over it. S partly because I, I bet you you'll get it in the evolution section again. But a Mullerian mimic is one that is also distasteful and harmful. A species that mimics, a distasteful or harmful species that mimic another distasteful or harmful species. A Batesian mimic is a harmless or a good tasting species that mimics one that's harmful or bad tasting. So just mem memorize that little difference and think about, um, think about them a bit and hopefully uh, you'll get it reinforced later in the course. Just wouldn't be introductory biology without it. Community ecology, we talked about definitions of communities, community boundaries, primary and secondary succession, Keystone species, dominant species, ecosystem engineers, things like that. Edges. These are natural edges in this system. These are ecotones. The boundaries between one community type and another community type. These edges represent ecotones in this natural context. We also spoke about edges in the artificial context, the anthropogenic context, and I'll get to that. Edges 
these ecotones are often very diverse in species because they incorporate species from this zone as well as this, this zone. They incorporate species from the neighboring communities. And they have species that are specific to the ecotone itself. That makes them so um, diverse oftentimes. They're often very productive as well. Remember that diversity we distinguish from species richness because species richness is just the total number of species in an area, in a community. But diversity also incorporates the relative balance of numbers of individuals of the different species. And if you haven't yet plugged this into your calculator, please do. No need to memorize it for the exam, though. You can plug it in with these numbers. <coughs> this second um, lecture in community ecology went more into succession and into R selection and K selection, and then we got into island biogeography. R selection and K selection are still confusing. Um, I focused on it here in the context of succession, and I'll stick, stick with that, but you can think of them more widely. R selected species are called that um, because they tend to influence the dynamics of rapid growth and reproduction, the phenomena associated with R, with the um, intrinsic capacity for growth. K-selected organisms are called that because they evolve, they are thought to have evolved in the context of communities um, and in populations at or near carrying capacity. So if you think about the forces, the natural selection forces that would act on populations living in this type of setting, in a, in a mature forest setting like this, they'd be different from the type of forces that would be acting on the plants in these very early successional stages. Plants here are going to need to get into this environment, start to absorb resources quickly, photosynthesize rapidly under a hot sun, and produce more offspring so they can grow in the same condition um, quickly. Whereas organisms in this context are going to be in perhaps more direct competition for sunlight and water with other organisms. They're going to have to grow tall, perhaps, to even access the sun. So they're going to have to uh, invest a lot in, in structural growth. And it turns out when organisms are surveyed, they show these, tre these trends and features that um, render them um, categorizable oftentimes into, into these types, R selection and K selection. But those are really just endpoints of the spectrum. And most species will fall somewhere in between, um, sometimes as a result of those differences in, um, in the successional context in which they evolved. Island biogeography. Let's try to clear that up a little bit. Remember MacArthur and Wilson and their studies of uh, mangrove islets off of Florida? And that the, this equilibrium number of species is this, is, can be predicted from the curves of immigration rate and extinction rate in an area. Where those curves cross, where those curves cross, you have this estimate of the equilibrium number of species expected on the site. We look at the effects of island size and distance to mainland in how they influence these rates of immigration or extinction. A small island is going to have, immigration rate is going to decline over time because the island, the island is starting to fill up with species. There's only a set number of species in the regional pool from which these, from which these islands can draw. We're thinking in ecological time here. We're not assuming any organisms are evolving are evolving in situ. So we're not thinking about species origination and whole species extinction. We're thinking about the arrival and disappearance of species, immigration and extinction locally from a regional pool of se a set number of species. On a small island, there will be fewer immigrants than on a large island because it's a smaller target if distance to mainland is held equal. On a small island, extinction rates will be higher because population numbers are lower than on a large island. And small populations have a 
greater likelihood of running to extinction. So that's the effect of island size on these rates. The distance from the mainland also will affect these rates. A far island is going to have fewer immigrants than a near island, again, because it's a less likely target to strike. <coughs> it's far away. It's going to have most organisms leaving the mainland will be close to the coasts, right? A far island is going to have a higher <coughs> extinction rate just because it will not receive the replenishment of new species as rapidly. And so a near island will have a lower number of extinctions because species, when species are close to extinction, they're more likely to be seeded from the mainland. And so it's related to uh, the immigration phenomenon. And depending on these curves, um, we have different estimates and predictions about the equilibrium number of species in these environments. And um, that's enough to say on that. Our first lecture on ecosystem ecology um, concerned trophic chains, <coughs> trophic cascades, and then ecosystem metabolism a bit. This Hubbard Brook example was used as an example of a, a natural um, field study of a whole ecosystem. <coughs> Someone asked, what was the point of that? It's, it's described well in your book, too. Uh, it's just a famous site for the study of field ecosystems, so study of ecosystems in the field. Remember, we have bottom-up types ca of causality and top-down types of ca causality in communities. Bottom-up causality is driven by changes in the dynamics at the base of the food web or at the base of the food chain, and even from physical factors. Um, that might influence the autotrophs. And the causes propagate upward. So changes in the number of hawks might be related to changes in the vegetation, even though the hawks aren't perching on this vegetation or eating it at all. It's a result of causality up the chain. The top-down forces um, are moving in the opposite direction. Um, they are stimulated by changes higher in the food web, higher in the food chains, and can run all the way um, to the base. In the example of the trophic cascade from Mount Zion, changes in human visitation patterns and mountain lion abundance affected uh, soil erosion along streams and rivers. Yes? So where do you find uh, the data for the trophic cascade cascades and carnivore production? Carnivore production? Oh, um, yes. That question concerning um, the biomass of Yes, that's related to that practice question. Um, I don't remember it exactly, but um, it's the one on it's the one on the amount of biomass at different uh, trophic levels, and it's you get that answer um, based on um, your pyramids of numbers, and this is built in terms of energy here in joules, but the same would apply in terms of uh, biomass where by a factor of 10, um, as, a, as a generalization, you have 10% the biomass or energy available at higher trophic levels. I'm going to have to um, avoid questions now with, with just about seven minutes. I'm going to use all the full seven minutes, but um, I'm probably going to have to wait on the questions. Office hours right after class for an hour, if you can do that. Um, yeah, so that's, this is a way to answer that question with reference to this type of pyramid. Um, remember that net primary production is a function of gross primary production minus respiration. Gross primary production is just how much, um, how much material, how much energy or material is captured by um, the autotrophs in a system. Secondary production is how much material or energy is captured by uh, the consumers, whether it's the the secondary consumers, tertiary, or so forth, even the detritus. So that's the difference between primary and secondary production. And um, you can see how much is lost to respiration in the process. That's what gives us this pyramid of energy or pyramid of numbers. We usually measure these phenomena in terms of um, calories, joules, or um, carbon, uh, because all organisms contain carbon, so it's a nice estimate. 
please check the book if you don't understand why the, um, a system like this is top heavy. Sometimes aquatic systems, the standing biomass is higher in the uh, higher trophic level than the lower trophic level than in the zooplankton than the phytoplankton. It's a result of um, rates of consumption, rates of death and birth in this, in this group. This figure can help you understand that. The energetic hypothesis, this, the point of this is to, um, well, the energetic hypothesis is a hypothesis to explain why food chains are short. They're short because there's not energy available at high, higher and higher trophic chains as a result of the inefficiency of transfers that we just discussed. You, if only 10% of the energy or material is making it across levels, at some point there's just not going to be enough to sustain higher and higher levels. That's the energetic hypothesis, and it was tested and supported in this study of tree holes, tree hole biology. People asked about other uh, um, possibilities. Um, I just didn't go into them, but um, in some models, long food chains are unstable. Effects get propagated from low in the food chain and destabilize and drive higher and higher um, trophic level occupants to extinction. So a dynamic stability hypothesis would be an alternative, just for fun, just because a lot of people ask. Glad you were curious. Um, Another possibility is that the consumers, higher and higher level consumers, tend to have to be larger, and there may be constraints on size of organisms, um, so you just can't keep getting bigger and bigger creatures, higher and higher in these food chains. I gave you the energetic hypothesis because it's the classic one and it's, it's quite well supported. Global air circulation patterns, you know, only focus on these insofar as they are related to the biology. If you don't understand the details of this dynamic too much, probably okay. Um, but do recognize why deserts tend to form around 30 degrees north and south latitude. That's, uh, that's the biological relevance of, of the phenomenon, okay? Um, yeah, people asked why, why the fog here um, in California. Cold water currents interacting with warm, warmer air masses generates fog and then through a couple different means, including this mechanism, that fog is pulled onto land or it's pushed from behind by other, by other systems. But this is one major mechanism, warming air pulling the foggy air off of the oceans onto land. And we used um, this example from Red Redwood Biogeochemistry as an example of ecophysiology. Physiology is just the study of the organs and tissues of organism that intra-organismal focus. If you set that intra-organismal focus into a whole ecosystem context, you have an ecophysiology. That's just what the term is a reference to, this, this great integration between individual physiology and whole ecosystem dynamics. Your climographs and your biomes, everyone wants to know what they need to know for the biomes, right? Um, you need to know, um, you need to be able to compare and contrast biomes. You're not responsible for all the details in the book figure, but this is just good stuff for an earthling to know. So certainly know the names of all these different types, know something about the differences in physiognomy and the differences in temperature and precipitation regimes under which you find them, um, things like that. Pretty general, not to the detail that the book requires, but in more detail than I gave you in, in lecture. Net primary production, um, we talked about that a bit just now and what it, what it means, um, different systems and their productivity. In paleoecology, oh my, I didn't go over uh, something that a lot of people had a problem with. Let me just tell you on this one, um, you're responsible for the generalities here also. <laughs> Definitely don't, un don't focus on the specifics in the nitrogen cycle, but you need to be able to compare and contrast the different types of cycle. Phosphorus being a, um, a system <coughs> based in the, in the sediments and carbon um, having a major atmospheric component. You need to understand the major components in each of these cycles, but certainly not the details, particularly in the nitrogen system. What I didn't go over was uh, biopurification of calcium and the trace elements. We'll skip it. I won't test you on it. Great field of study. and. Uh, really important in ecology these days, biogeochemistry, but um, I didn't get to it. <laughs>
just whatever's in your book. The demographic transition I made a mistake on. Um, I started to refer to the demographic transition as starting in this period. The demographic transition really happens in starting in this period, technically, when birth rates start dropping in relation to the already decreasing death rates. That was just a simple, um, simple difference and a mistake I made. All right, gang, um, I told you I'd finish with a couple pictures of my kids at some point, so I have some pictures of my kids at the end. Bye, everybody.